So why write about Homer? Well, one of the things I love about writing about Homer is the fact that you get to engage with centuries of other people who've written about Homer. So when you're writing about Homer, you're really always also writing about all the other people who've been thinking about, responding to, critiquing, and reimagining Homer. And I think for some people that can be intimidating, that can be scary, it can feel like you have a millennia of other stuff to get through, but I actually think it can also be really entertaining, really fun, really powerful to see how this iconic, canonical author has been reinvented, has been reimagined, and has been recreated in different cultures, in different centuries, and in different traditions. So for me, that's part of the power of engaging with a figure like Homer, is it allows you to see how all these other moments and people and places have worked with and reconfigured this important and major author. So one of my favorite examples is there's a Greek author named Lucian. Um, he is writing centuries after Homer wrote. So even though he's an ancient author, Homer's still a kind of canonical, authoritative author for him too. And he writes these kind of irreverent and sort of humorous re reworkings of the Homeric tradition. And he has this wonderful dialogue where he has a cobbler talking to a chicken. And it turns out the chicken is the philosopher Pythagoras, who's been reincarnated and turned into a chicken. And they're talking about Greek literature and Greek philosophy, and at some point Homer comes up. And Pythagoras tells the cobbler that, you know what, Homer actually didn't write any of the epics that we think he wrote. In fact, Homer wasn't even present during the Trojan War. Where, where was Homer? Homer was in Bactria, and at that point he was a camel. So we have these wonderful anecdotes where this figure we think of as this kind of giant of the Western tradition and this sort of crucial foundation for all of literature afterward actually has this wonderful, irreverent, colorful, funny afterlife that I think engaging with the sort of reworkings of Homer can really bring to light. Um, I think another wonderful aspect of writing on Homer is the way in which there's so much energy around Homeric translation. And I think we're especially seeing this today. We're seeing the translations of Emily Wilson. She's the first woman to ever translate the Odyssey. And her translation has produced this incredible excitement and energy, not just around Homer as an author, not just around his epics themselves, but also around the idea of translation as an act that makes the past immediate, that makes the past present. And her translation has been really fascinating because it's also brought to light what is the role of the translator? What does it mean for the first woman to translate the Odyssey? What does that tell us about how the act of translation participates in the kind of construction and interpretation of these epics? And so we see moments in her translation where we really see a kind of latent sexism that lingers in previous translations really being sort of corrected or sort of softened. And it's beautiful and it's powerful. One of my favorite examples of that is we've long had a kind of tradition in English translations of Homer of the figure in Odysseus's home called the maid, right? She's the maid, she's the maid, fine. Actually, if you look at the Greek, it really is closer to slave woman. She's not really a maid, she's a slave. But this translation has kind of glossed over a really harsh reality about the ancient world. And when we look at Emily Wilson's translation, that's really brought back into our view. It's brought back into our perspective.